Welcome to lecture number 21 for ECE 320, Electronics 1, TTL logic, or transistor-transistor logic. Now, in the previous lecture, we covered DTL logic. That's using max functions and min functions with diodes coupled with, with a transistor to clean up the logic levels. That works, but it has slow logic because of the diodes. To speed up the logic, I need to get rid of the diodes, and that's where TTL logic comes into play. Now, the basic part of a TTL logic gate is this. I've got two transistors, and notice I got rid of the diode. And this first transistor is if the input is 0 volts, current flows left, uh, making the base low, and it turns off. If VN is high, current now flows right, transaturating the transistor, giving a 0. So this is a TTL inverter. To see how that works, you can take the two cases. First, let's assume that the input is 0 volts. In that case, the current here has a path to ground, either goes left, 3.7 volts, or right. This is actually a diode right here. This is an NPN device. That's a PN junction, so going right is also 0.7 volts, plus 0.7. The current's going to take the easiest path to ground, going left. That results in no current into the base of the second transistor. If this transistor has no current, it's off and I have 5 volts out. Uh, the other case is if the input is 5 volts. This is where it gets kind of tricky. If you notice, this is an NPN device, current going left, current going this way, the gain is 100. I can dope the transistor so that going the other way, this is still NPN, that's still a transistor, but now the doping makes the beta or the current gain really, really bad, like 0.25. The reason I do that is because if Vn is 5 volts, here's the easiest path to ground through those two diodes. So T1 turns on, T2 turns on. The current is 5 minus 1.4 over 4K, 0.9 milliamps. That gets amplified by beta. If I had a beta of 100, I'll try to be pulling 90 milliamps from Vn, and that's actually bad. That's going to cause a lot of loading issues, uh, reducing the fan out, causing problems with the previous gate. It's got a source 90 milliamps. I'd like this to be zero. That's why I designed this transistor to have a really lousy beta when I use it backwards. If beta is one fourth, then the 0.9 milliamps pulls in beta IB 0.22 milliamps from VN. Uh, together, that gives you 0.12 milliamps. If beta is 100, that allows 11 milliamps to flow. I only need two. So beta IB is more than IC, transistor 2 is saturated. Uh, the power consumption. I've got 5 volts supplying 0 0.9 plus 2.4. 5 volts is supplying 3.3 .3 milliamps. That produces 16.5 milliwatts. Um, that's when you're on. When it's off, it's 5.5 milliwatts. That may not seem like a lot, but it is a problem. When you deal with computers that have millions of gates, uh, I can't handle, you know, 1 million times 16 milliwatts, that's 16 kilowatts of heat. The computer's going to get hot. I need a different technology. That'll come up a little bit later when we get to CMOS technology. The logic levels for TTL logic. For this gate, as long as current goes right, this will saturate. To make sure it goes right, this needs to be at least uh, 0.7 volts. Um, and for it to go left, again it's 0.7. So ideally it'll switch at 0.7. I can build that in circuit lab and see where it turns on and off. Actually it's right here. As long as the voltage is above 700 millivolts, the transistor is saturated like I predicted. It's got to go a little bit below 0.7 for it to saturate. I go through this region right here. That's actually the active region for the transistor. I don't saturate until this point at 0.52 volts. So that's the logic level for that gate. 0.7 volts is logic 1. 0.52 is logic 0. In terms of fan out, this is where a lousy beta is good. If I have a gate like this attached over here, this is supposed to be 5 volts. If it's 5 volts dropping 0.22 milliamps, you know the gates over here at V out, each 0.22 milliamps drops the voltage over here by 0.44 volts. The bigger the current, the bigger the voltage drop. If I'm only allowed a 2 volt drop at the output, 
then I can only have a fan out of 4.54 gates. If I could design this with a worse beta, I could have a better fan out. And in terms of the max clock frequency, this is a little bit better than DTL logic because they don't have those diodes in there. But if I look at the time it takes to go from logic level 0 to logic level 1, that's about 80 nanoseconds. That sets the maximum clock frequency to about 10 megahertz with this DTL logic. Now that's kind of the base idea behind DTL logic. The 7400 series of gates that you use in ECE 275 actually is a little bit different. This is the same circuit that we had before, the T1, T2. In addition, I had two more transistors. What these do is they increase the current capability. When or transistor 4 is on, I've got the output tied to ground through a single transistor. It's got much higher current capability. When T4 is off and T3 is on, I'm pulled high through 130 ohms. That lower resistance gives you higher current capability. So that's actually how the 7400 gates are built. Uh, to see how that works, let's take the first case when V in is 0. If V in is 0, current goes left. T1 turns on, that makes this 0.2 volts. Tries to pull current going left. There is no source of current. This is a reverse bias diode up top. That's reverse bias diode. So the current is zero. Now current means that T2 is off, meaning that T4 is off. And I just have this path to the output. So the output will be five volts, uh, minus a couple voltage drops for the transistor or the diodes and transistors. If the N is five volts, uh, now current will refer going to this path to ground. Here's one diode, two diodes, three diodes. This will take the path to the right at 2.1 volts rather than the path left at 5 volts. So the voltages are 0.7, 1.4, 2.1. The current is 0.52 milliamps, amplified by beta. So this guy really saturates. The reason for this diode is if this diode is on, this is 0.7. This is saturated 0.9. If I take out that diode, I've got 0.9 volts on the left, 0.7 plus 0.2, also 0.9. I don't really know what the voltages are. When I include this diode right here, they make sure that T3 is off. So otherwise T3 could be on if we get current flow through that diode. And that's what I want. I don't want both these on, because if I do have them both on, I just short a power to ground. In terms of fan out, I'm um, logic level one as long as the output's more than 1.6 volts. Each gate draws 0.13 milliamps. That 0.13 milliamps comes through this 130 ohm resistor. So the voltage right here is 5 minus 130 times the number of gates times 0.13 minus 0.7. That's got to be bigger than 1.6 volts. So I think gives you 159. That's a big advantage of. T or TTL logic. Before I had a fan out of 4, nope, <coughs> excuse me, now I've got a fan out of 159. In Circuit Lab, I can simulate the circuit to see how it behaves. And I can find the max clock, clock frequency. Uh, again, it's about 400 nanoseconds to go from logic level 0 to logic level 1, from here to here. That makes the max clock frequency about 2 megahertz. And if I look at the current, again, there are spikes. On logic level 1 to 0 transitions, I get these current spikes. Again, that's typical of any time you have switching logic. I tend to have spikes on the 0, 1, 1, 0 transitions, meaning if you have an analog section of the circuit, keep it away from the digital section. The di digital section is going to be adding noise to your analog section. Uh, those are for inverters. For a NAND gate, what you do is, this is a transistor. The uh, base is a p-type region. I have a little n-type region inside that p-region and connect it. That's my emitter. If I have three different little n-pads inside that region, I can have three emitters, three different outputs. If any of these are zero, there's a path to ground. If all of them are high, the current goes right. So that gives you a NAND gate. Uh, one last thing to mention about TTL logic. 
and the 7400 series. Some of them are open collector outputs. What that means is on the last stage, instead of having this T3 in a diode, they just eliminate them and just give you T4. The output of this gate is then either high impedance when this is open or short to ground when it's turned on or saturated. If I look at this with a voltmeter or an oscilloscope, I won't see anything. I just see low impedance, high impedance. To see a voltage, I need a pull-up resistor. The reason for that, for using open collector outputs, is it's very easy to change logic levels. If I don't want to have 5 volts out, but I want 12 volts out, just pull it up to 12 volts. If I want a different resistance or different current, I change that resistor. This also allows you to do things called wired OR logic. With wired OR logic, I take three devices with open collector outputs and just short them all together. What that does is there's no, there's no conflict. If A says 5 volts, B says 0 volts, C says 5 volts, uh, smoke doesn't get out, there's not a fire, there's not a problem. All that happens is this is off, on, off. I've got a path to ground. Y is grounded, so Y is 0 volts. If two of them say 0 volts, I just ground it, ground it. You know, again, it's not a problem. It's really grounded. This is called zero priority encoding. This is how a CAN bus works in a car. I can have multiple sensors all talking on the same bus, and there's not a conflict. If any of them broadcast a zero, then the zero wins. So what happens on a CAN bus is suppose A, B, and C are both trying to send a message. A sends a one, B sends a one, C sends a one, and if I look at the bus, the answer is high, the answer is one. All these transistors are turned off. The next time frame, a sends a 1, B sends a 1, C sends a 0. 0 means this transistor is turned on. The output is grounded. What happens at the output is that the 0 wins. C, C sends a 0, gets a 0. A and B sent a 1, but the bus is a 0. That tells A and B that somebody else just stepped on my signal. Somebody else has priority. They go quiet and wait. Next time frame, A and B then try again. A and B send a 1, answers 1. A and B send a 1, answers 1. Then right here. A sends a 0, B sends a 1, A wins. So A sends the rest of its message, and the next time frame, B tries again. That's typical of a CAN bus. Each message will try, try, try again, and eventually it'll get through. Advantage is I can have basically an unlimited number of sensors on the CAN bus. Eventually they will get their message through. I can set the priority. If I want to have something like engine on fire, being very high priority, that make sure that message gets through. Just precede the message with a bunch of zeros. It will step on everyone else's message. It will get through. Um, that's kind of where open collector outputs are useful. They're extremely useful in building buses on computer networks. That's lecture number 21, TTL logic for ECE 320 Electronics 1.